How many years now? 18 years. Isn't that uh, something? It it's has, gone by. It has gone by so quick. And, yep. uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity uh, just to take a moment and say to all of, now, Steve, you are a volunteer firefighter, but just, just to all of our first responders, yeah. uh, to all of our military personnel, to all of our uh, folks who are serving, making uh, life safe and protecting, um, we are just incredibly grateful. Steve, do you have anything yes. you want to say to our first responders and our military, both retired and active? Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm very appreciative uh, of our first responders. You know, the military. My dad was uh, 28 years in the uh, in he was in the Army Air Corps during World War II, and um, he was he matter of fact uh, the next day after they attacked Pearl Harbor, his ship came in there and they were cleaning up that mess. But then my dad 28 years, and then my brother was in the Seventh Special Forces. And then I had asthma, so there was no going to the Vietnam for me or service. So, but those uh, the military folks that put their life on the line and uh, and serve our United States in the military, uh, you you just can't you can't say enough thank yous about them, you know. And then you got first responders. Of course, my son, he's a captain in the uh, fire department in Mesa, and he's also uh, a special ops paramedic. So when they get in a gunfight, Sean's in there patching things up. He's been special ops paramedic three years in a row now of the year. So, and then I do it because I want to help my community out here. And it's a, uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to uh, put forth the effort and, and, and help out the communities. You know, it's a great deal. I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. So to all of our, uh, to all of our first responders out there, to all of our friends who are uh, veterans, uh, to all of our uh, friends who are uh, active and uh, retired, and then uh, protecting and serving around the globe. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, we're very, very grateful for it, and it allows us to do a lot of the stuff that, that we enjoy doing in, in our pastime and, and, uh, and for some of us profession here working with animals. So, uh, Steve, I'm excited for this week's conversation. We've got yep. a long list of questions uh, to get to. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to welcome and say, hey, if this is the first time you're ever hanging out with us, we are so grateful and glad that you're here every single week. Uh, me, Dave Shrine, and uh, and then Steve, we get together and we just talk mules and donkeys for about an hour. And uh, we get a lot of really good questions. Uh, sometimes we get questions uh, coming up every single week and we are happy to answer those. And uh, sometimes, occasionally, we'll get a question that we've never been asked. Uh, so really, there's yeah. three things for you to do uh, if you're hanging out with us today. The first thing is uh, just let us know that you're here. Put a comment in the comment section with your name and where you're watching from. We just yep. want to acknowledge you and say we are glad that you're here. We're glad that you're with us. Uh, we are glad that whether you own, uh, whether you ride, whether you drive, or whether you're looking to do one of those three, that you're here spending some time with us learning about mules and donkeys. Uh, so let us know that you're here. Number two, ask your questions. Any and every question is okay. There are no dumb questions. Uh, except the one you don't ask because, hey, folks, we want to help you. We want to make sure you get the most joy out of these animals. Uh, and you know how to talk donkey and mule. Who would have ever heard of thought of such a thing, learning how to talk donkey and mule? Uh, yeah. So make sure you ask that question. And then the third thing is if you're watching on Facebook, just click that share button. Uh, that is really the best. Uh, folks will say, hey, thanks for doing the broadcast week after week. Well, the number one way you can show your thanks is by sharing uh, with uh, with your friends and your family on Facebook. That's how we get new people in, uh, new people, new questions, and new folks enjoying mules and donkeys. So that's that's really what we've got going on. Steve, do you have anything you want to say before we get into our uh, into our greetings for all the folks watching us today? No, I'm, uh, I'm I'm fired up. I can't wait to see who's out there and what kind of questions we have. Yeah, I got I got Jess laying down here next to me right now. Yeah, Steve. there we go. Good old border collie there, Jess. Yep. All right, let's see here. I'm trying to pull it up. Facebook just sometimes gets pretty funky and doesn't want to pull everything up. So give me one second, folks. I want to make sure we've got all of our friends here. All right, we got a good crew. Uh, Tracy is watching from Queensland, Australia, and right away we go <laughs> international. There we go. It didn't hey, take long. Tracy. Hey, Tracy. Uh, Dan from uh, St. Augustine, Texas. We've got Linda from rural, humid, rural, central Ohio. We've got David Scholl. 
David and Dyshaw. Hey, guys, how's it going? Good to have you here joining us from the great down under. Uh, Eileen from sunny Nebraska. Prayers for our country today. Yes, yeah. Eileen. Uh, amen. Uh, Jason is watching from Pennsylvania. Says, glad I caught you too. Jason, we are so glad you're here as well. Uh, let's see here. We've got Rebecca. Rebecca watching from North Carolina. Rebecca, were you and I emailing back and forth about some videos? I think we were. Um, hopefully my last email got you all set up, able to watch that donkles, donkey saddle foundation training video. If not, let me know. We'll take care of it. Karen, uh, from California is hanging out here. David Pengelly, how is the new cowboy saddle different from the last one? What does it weigh? Steve, while I bring up YouTube here and make sure that we get all our YouTube friends, uh, greeted, why don't you tell us what's going on with the new cowboy saddle? Well, that's, it's kind of different. Uh, you know, we were talking about giving it a name and, and uh, uh, a couple of, of or several of you have different names for it. They got the one that's kind of touching me right now called uh, Cowboy Heritage. And I, I kind of like that a little bit. But anyway, I, I'll get a name from one of you. What it is, is the Cowboy has been the original saddle that I started out with. That's the one that we finally had taken all the pieces and put it together and said okay we've ridden it long enough we've done enough with it that's that's what we're going to do and that was for me and my cowboys and my uh, packers and this sort of thing uh a few hundred years ago it seems like anyway uh but now uh i'm i'm going to kind of reincarnate it a little bit and uh i'm going to go with uh a wood tree in it and i've got a some new things coming up but the saddle is going to weigh uh, almost three pounds less. So instead of 28 pounds, it's going to wear 25 pounds. We've got a new leather that we're trying. It's really soft. And, uh, uh, but just like anything else, Dave, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to try it and, uh, and we'll go take it down there and draw the ranch and we'll ride and, and, uh, make sure it's what we want, but we have not changed anything as far as how it fits the mule. We're, all we're doing is changing uh, some of the leather and uh, and and the the tree itself. So anyway, we got some new things up and coming. It's going to be unique. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Steve and I are going to get some time down at the Andrada Ranch um, to uh, to talk about the new saddle, to put some videos together. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, I've got our YouTube friends over here. Uh, we've got Richard watching from uh, Palestine. We've got or East Texas. We've got uh, Jeremy says, Jeremy Camburn says, hi, Steve. We've got Diane Andrews, uh, Watertowny. We've got, let's see, uh, Dale Williamson. Dale, it's always good to hear from you watching from Keller, Texas. we got Kate Elizabeth watching from Queensland, Australia. So Tracy and Kate can go hang out, and they can be our mule community down under with uh, Di and David. we got a good representation from Australia today. So How about uh, that? Steve, Diane has a question over on YouTube. She says, I would like to know about a McClellan saddle. So, Steve, why don't you take a moment to tell us about the McClellan saddle and, and kind of maybe some of the differences between a McClellan saddle and then maybe the saddle that you've chosen to design after learning from the mule. Sure. Well, the McClellan saddle is basically a, a military saddle. It's got one single cinch. It's called a Y cinch, and it comes down from a, a ring in the back, ring in the front, and comes down, and then comes down in the center. It's one cinch. Uh, it's, it's also very small because a lot of the military back then was actually a lot of really young guys, 14, 15 inch saddles were pretty much an average. The only way that you knew the difference between a horse saddle and the mule saddle was the mule saddle had a horn on it and it was a brass horn. And, and, and that was what they had, you know, for, during the military. Uh, with the military and they still do ride uh, in parades and stuff like this with a saddle similar to it. Now that saddle was designed for that mule, that time frame, this sort of thing. That, that saddle is, is, does not, is not able to fit the, this new horse that we have, the modern horse, the quarter type horse. Back then it was kind of more of a thoroughbred type horse. And then the mule uh, was more of a thoroughbred type mule. So the trees are completely different. But the biggest problem that we have is they only have the one cinch. Now, the, the mule saddle did have a second cinch, but the cinch is in the wrong place. 
for the rear cinch, but it did have two cinches. So that's it in a nutshell. Very good. So it's hopefully light. that answers a little bit of your question there and uh, gives you a little bit of education there. That's kind of what we do here is uh, education on the past, education on the future, and hopefully get your, uh, get your mule working the way they need to. Because a lot of times what will happen is if you don't address some of these problems as they come up or you don't address them correctly, uh, you might say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. But down the road, six months, even 12 months, 18 months down the road, uh, you have three new problems. And so really the education, folks will say all the time, Steve, what do I need to do? I want to be a new mule owner. I want to get a, my first mule. What do I need to do? Education, education. Ain't that right, Steve? That's right. You know, you want to educate yourself. I, One of my clients I talked to yesterday, he actually bought the video, So You Want to Buy a Mule. And he watched it and watched it and uh, went and to look at a mule and started deciding, well, okay, I like the mule disposition, but he didn't like something about the confirmation. So he went and had a veterinarian take a look at it. The veterinarian said, no, nah, he's got a bad rear foot, you know, and so he knew what to look for by that, you know. And, and I might also touch on the McClellan saddle is, you know, uh, it rolls really easy. Uh, it's not set up for a breaching uh, with breaching rings and this sort of thing too. So, uh, and folks, you got to remember, you have to have a breaching. Very good. Uh, so I've got a question here from Scott. He's asking about the McClellan saddle. So I'll send him this section, but his specific question uh, is, uh, so back in my youth, I worked for the BLM out West. We rode nearly every day and I must and must have uh, everyone, and everyone must have had a modern Western saddle. But as the last guy to show up, uh, all that was left was an old McClellan saddle. At first, I was a little put out, but after a week, I learned to fit it to my horse and myself, uh, and in time, I learned to love it. I found that I had less discomfort and could ride longer and further than my counterparts. Enough backstory. My question is, are McClellan saddles mule-friendly? I've watched your videos on saddles and thought that there were similarities between your trees and that of the McClellan. So it sounds like maybe with the, the single cinch and now needing two cinches, that's one of the major differences if someone's going to do it, I mean, is there any way to do it the right way? Or do you just want to say, hey, nope, not today, different yeah. time, different animal? Yeah, I've actually had a McClellan at one time, and uh, it was a, a mule saddle with a, with a brass horn. And I did a bunch of rigging on it. I tried to get it to work, and I just couldn't get it to work right, Dave. It just, uh, you know, it might work pretty fair on one animal, but it didn't the other. But the downside was... Uh, a few months down the road when the back started getting sore and I started seeing what was going on, I just quit using it altogether. And that's the key thing, folks. When it comes down to these meals, they may not show it right off the bat. It's going to be down the road as you go on down and, and you start using them more and more. You'll start seeing how the animal starts getting sore. Um, I had a client talk to me yesterday and he was using a, a saddle. And I'm not going to say the name brand, two of them. And both of them soared the animal right at the three spines of, at the back of the hip and, and soared them up really bad. Well, the one saddle did soared them up really bad. And so he asked me uh, about my saddle pad, if that'll fix the problem, you know. And, uh, and I said, well, tell me about the problem. And it was the three bones. So long story short, I said, look, if my saddle pad is not going to fix the problem. Look at the back of your saddle. See how it's sewed together. He said, yes, it is. And I said, I said, do you see that is what's rubbing? That's why the back of my saddles are open so that it doesn't rub on that area. That's what makes my saddle so unique is that I've found all these problems and that I tried to find ways to fix it so that when it did go on a mule that had that particular makeup or body shape or something, it would work and work fine. Very good. Good, good, good. Uh, next question I got. This one comes from Walter on Facebook. And so Walter's got this one. He says, hi, Steve. I, re I re uh, received the remainder of my order today. I'm very satisfied with your saddle and tack. We love hearing that, Walter. Thank you. My question to you is my wife's mule threw me off due to tightening the rear cinch so tight and slipping in his flanks. Uh, this has been a, uh, four months ago, and I've not attempted to ride him since. Can you give any advice on how I should ease myself back into the saddle with confidence? Dusty is a really good, easygoing mule. I have noticed him to be a little bit more shy uh, being approached. Thank you, and have a very blessed evening. What would you say here to Walter? Okay, it sounds like if the rear cinch went up, he didn't have the hobble strap 
that goes from the front cinch to the back cinch. That hobble strap is really important, folks. When you have your two cinches there, if, if they're not hobbled together with a leather strap, then that, that back cinch will go up. There's a good possibility of that because of the mule beam hourglass belly. And then, of course, the breast collar attaches to the front of the cinch, and then the hobble cinch, and then the back cinch. So that was most likely it. Okay, now to go back to the riding part. The first thing I would do is start acclimating your mule to getting to understand that that saddle is not going to bite him again. Okay. Um, and, and, and that can happen a, a, a majority of ways. But anyway, uh, get your hobble strap on there, tighten it up, and uh, let the mule stand a lot. Let the mule go and, and, walk, and walk him around some, maybe pony him, things like that. Let him start feeling the saddle, and then, and then you start doing some groundwork with him. That'll start building your confidence, and away you go. Yeah, very good. Groundwork, 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 yep. saddle foundation. That just seems to be the thing that we always go back to, whether it's training, yep. tune-up, or rebuilding confidence and, and teaching the mule new cues. That's fantastic. Um, yep. Let's see. We've got uh, Jarrett over on YouTube watching. Howdy, Jarrett. Jarrett's got the question. Hi, guys. How do you teach a young mule – to back up while under saddle. I am riding in the Mule Riders Martingale. Thank you. What would you have okay. to say there to Jared? Okay, so backing up is very, very important. If you've got a good backup, that means you're going to have a good stop. And if you don't have a good backup, your stop ain't going to be any good. So, whoa, it's really important. So, this is what I do. I hold my reins like this, all right? And as I'm holding my reins... I'm going to, to hold my left side solid and I'm going to take my right side and I'm just going to bump, 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 bump like that. So I'm going to start bumping, bump, bump, bump. And then I'm going to increase the intensity and I'm going to increase the intensity and I'm going to increase the intensity until I get him to drop his nose. Now, sometimes they'll even go even quicker. You barely bump them. One, two, three, they drop their nose. All right. When they drop their nose, drop your hands, get quiet a second. Pick them back up again. Go back to bumping again. Notice the left side solid. The right side is bumping. So bump, 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 bump. So the mule's thinking, all right, to get you to quit bumping on my nose, I'm going to drop my nose, and then you're going to let go of me, right? Well, no, not this time, because I now I want you to move a shoulder. So I'm going bump, bump, bump. He drops his nose, thinking, okay, let go of me. And nope, I still got you. So, all right, what do I have to do? And then he moves his shoulder. And then the next step after that, he moves his foot. Three on the right, three on the left. I quit today. And then I go the five days later or the next day. And I do those three on each side. And then I do three more on each side, three, six, nine, 12, until I get my back up. Where people make mistakes, Dave, is they tend to pull on both reins at the same time to get a back up. Well, then the mule stiffens all five major neck muscles braces himself and he's got you but if you teach one half of the time the right brain or the left brain first and just simply just think bumping notice i'm not moving my hand a lot i'm just rolling my wrist rolling my wrist and then you'll start getting the back up in a short time now do i want to get out there and do this seven days in a row make sure that he knows make sure that he's familiar with it make sure that that you know old fluffy there is getting it do i want to be that aggressive in my training? No, that's the worst thing you can do. What what you want to do, folks, is if you're doing it right, the mule is going to remember what was the most easiest, comfortable way for him. So if you're doing it right, you can train today and uh, on, a, on, on, on Wednesday and wait till Friday or even Monday and, and, and go to the next three. It's the worst thing in the world for you to hammer train every single day. They, they can't handle all the pressure. They start getting sore and they start getting grumpy and then you're up a creek. So three, six, nine, 12. I'm going to do three on, on Wednesday. I'm going to do three more plus that six on, on uh, Friday. And then Monday, I'm going to do nine. Do it like that, whatever, but just don't pound on them every day. Very good. That's a good word. Um, all right, so let's get back to our uh, to make sure that we've got everyone uh, watching here. Real quick, if uh, if you're just watching, if this is your first time ever hanging out, my name's Dave. This is Steve, 
and we're just here to talk mules and donkeys for the next little bit. If you got any questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the comment section. Matter of fact, go ahead, introduce yourself, let us know that you're here, let us know that you're watching, and then uh, just put that in the comment cell section, your name and where you're watching from. Then go ahead, ask any questions you've got, and share the broadcast with your friends. That's all we ask. Um, right here we got Karen from California, we've got Travis from South Carolina, we've got, uh, let's see, Walter from Fairfax Bay Area, California, we've got Sharon from uh, Hartwick, New York, you are right on, and all listen, uh, all should listen and learn, love that Sharon, thank you. We've got David from Port Angeles, Washington, uh, Linda, huge fans for all of the links and articles that have arrived in email this week. Linda, you're welcome, we're very thrilled to be able to provide everything we yep. do. Uh, Sharon Williams says, "Love the hat, Steve. Any any uh, any um, uh, story on the hat there?" This hat was made by a friend of mine who actually makes hats. It's a custom-made hat, and I don't know if you can see on the inside, but it's got my name on it, and uh, and this sort of thing. It's a cust. It's all completely custom-made. Nice hat, very comfortable. It's uh, it's a hat that is. Uh, this is kind of a Montana crown, yeah, and and then the the Texas uh, brim here, but it, it's a great, it's a very comfortable hat. So let me ask you this, Steve: Where does one get a good cowboy hat? Huh. Well, it, it depends on what one's pocketbook, David. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm not going to tell you what this hat cost it because. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it it it's quite it it's, it can be quite expensive. It's, a lot that it's, goes it's into custom, it, huh? It's custom made, yeah, and it's um it's uh, it's like twelve X Beaver or something like that. It's 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 pretty pretty good hat. But where do you get one? Uh, lots of uh, Western stores have them. Uh, you can go online. Even Amazon has them and this sort of thing. Very good. Uh, but I, we, think I, we, we, I mean, I think I need to get myself one. So I was at, oh, yeah. uh, I was in Wyoming and uh, I was at Yellowstone and they had just this rack full of hats. And I saw one for like 100, 140, 160. I was like, man, these are expensive. I was like, I need yeah. to ask Steve. I want to make sure that I get a good hat at a good value. So maybe I'll go on Amazon, see what I can find, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. I, yeah. We've got, uh, we can get you fixed up with a hat. You don't need to. You, you know, you can buy a good straw hat for around 30 bucks. You know? <laughs> Maybe that's what I'll start with. That'll that's be what my you cowboy start starter with. hat is a good straw hat. Okay, yeah, let's see right. here. We've got Richard. If Richard's watching on Facebook and YouTube, he is uh, he is double live streaming it. So, Richard, we're wow. glad to have you on both platforms, boosting our numbers a little bit there. Yolanda from the Netherlands reporting for duty. Hello, Yolanda. It's good to have you here. <laughs> we are international. We are in Australia. We are in the Netherlands. Uh, could not be more thrilled. Uh, let's see here. We've got David Cantor. So, David was with, the with us last week, asked a few good questions here. He says, Steve, what typically and how do you carry necessities on a trail ride? So, what necessities do you need? And how do you carry them on a trail ride? Uh, have worked for S and R. I always want to pack enough stuff so I don't make it out that night. Uh, night, it is no big deal. Uh, so, what would you say there? How do you go about uh, packing properly? Well, you know, if, if all you got is your saddle animal, uh, the main thing I have is a way to start a fire and and a good sharp knife. Uh, if I've got a fire and a good knife, uh, I can I can do about anything I want to do. I spent a lot of nights out uh, just sleeping in my shafts because, and we start a good fire and that's where we end up, especially when you're riding all these Bronx, these darn old Bronx that come uncorked and, and you end up spending the night there. So, uh, you know, the big problem, what you don't want to do folks is have all these great big saddlebags laying across the back of the animal. You don't need that weight bouncing on the kidneys. If you ever see a, a a mule or a horse die uh, of aceteria, and that's what that is, is is the weight banging and flopping this sort of thing on the muscles across the top of the kidneys, and and they get frustrated, and they start to, anyway, they, it, it gets to be really ugly. It's called aceteria, and, and it's a lot to do with the food, but it's also a lot to do with the saddlebags in the back. If you're going to put saddlebags on, Put them, put them, put them a bag on the front. And as long as you can start a fire 
and got a good sharp pocket knife, that's about all you need to have. I mean, uh, I've, uh, I used to carry a lot of different things. Uh, I especially carried in my hat a needle so that if I had a prolapsed cow or something, I could stitch that up. Uh, but basically just uh, a, a, a good way to start a fire. And, and I like to well, start a fire. You can make cotton balls uh, that are really good for starting fires. And you can put wax on them and this sort of thing. Uh, but just a way to start a fire and a good sharp knife. That's, that's what I would tell you. Very good. That's great. Uh, we've got Kat over on YouTube. Kat's got a question. It says, when teaching a mule to go from pulling slash driving a wagon to then go under saddle, how do you teach them to move forward and out? So what does forward and out mean? And then how do you teach them when they're used to one thing and now you're transitioning to another? Well, it's just a matter of, of just moving forward is what it amounts to. So when you're in a wagon, you're going to ask them to go to the right or to the left. And then you're going to use your long quirk and tap them in the croup. And then that will start getting them to go forward. Well, when you're in a saddle, you, you're going to use your legs. So you're going to ask them to go to the left or to the right. And at the same time, use your legs, bump, 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 to get them to go forward. Now, when you use your legs, you want to use right brain, left brain, not both brains at the same time. So right brain, left brain, and, uh, and then use your hands accordingly. And just ask them just to go a little at a time. They'll go good. Very good. Very good. Hope that helps there, Cat. Cat's from Missouri, by the way, watching from Missouri. Uh, Susan says, watching from Western Pennsylvania. Thanks again for all of the information. Uh, our pleasure. We're very, very happy to show up and hang out every single week. And it's good to have a couple weeks in a row after a couple weeks where we were kind of here, there, and everywhere. Uh, let's see here. Make sure we've got everyone who's watching. Uh, we said Karen from uh, California, Travis from South Carolina, uh, Fairfax. Let me go down here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tim Trammell watching from Kansas. We've got uh, a lot of Australia today. We've got Denny Woods, uh, New South Wales, Australia. Just began following your page yesterday. Denny, we are glad to have you here. Thanks for hanging out with us a little bit. Uh, yeah. Linda says, I've never sat in one, but I've heard that the McClellan saddle is very uncomfortable for the rider. So a lot of comments on the McClellan. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you find it comfortable when you were riding for you? I mean, obviously, it's no. not good for the mule. You didn't find it comfortable? No, I didn't find it comfortable at all. Um, there, uh, It's really hard to find something uh, like in a 16-inch size. Uh, but it's um, they, they don't, they've got a great big slot through the middle cause, because those mules and horses back then were really high-boned high, high boned in, their, in their spine. And so you had that slot down through the middle. Uh, and then they would throw a blanket underneath there. That, that's what they slept on. Uh, before the military, they hardly ever used blankets. That's the purpose of the wool underneath there. And so, uh, but I, I did not find it comfortable at all. Uh, and I really tried different things to, to make it work. But, you know, especially since it was supposed to be, that was back when I was searching, it was supposed to be, quote, a mule saddle right. uh, with that brass horn. And I kept searching, trying to figure out, you know, what was best, works for the best for the mule. And actually, <laughs> I had it all the time with my pack saddle, but I just wasn't thinking packing and riding, you know. Yeah, that's right. Um, all right. So Linda has a follow up question, says, does your saddle come with the hobble strap that goes between the two cinches? When when I send out cinches, I do send out a hobble strap. I also send out a video that says do it like this. The saddle basically comes with four nylon latigos and that's all. Then you have to add cinches, add breeches, breast collars, and this sort of thing. But I do talk about it in my video uh, and, I, and I actually use a, a string to do it with. It's kind of a cowboy way of doing it. But uh, these days I usually send out a leather strap about this long and, uh, and then that way you can hobble the two cinches together. Um, so I'm going to put a link. We've got a link to the Mule Saddle training course. Um, yeah. And in that Mule Saddle training course, there's a video. It's also on YouTube. Um, and you can look for it on YouTube, just uh, measuring for cinches. But in the Mule Saddle training course, you'll find a uh, 
let's see, mule saddle training course. I'm going to put it out on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, inside that course, there is uh, there are a couple sections talking about cinches, both measuring and positioning them. So folks, you'll find that really, really helpful, uh, making sure you get them in the right positions at the right lengths. Very, very important, uh, those cinches are. Okay, let's keep looking here. Um, we've got uh, Lori, Lori and Nikki are watching. We've got Richard Matthews. Hi, Chaplain Steve. Good to have you here again, Richard. Uh, Jana oh. Griffin. Hi, guys. Tuning in from Arkansas today. So down there in the Midwest. We've got Carol watching from Missouri, watching uh, Robert watching from Mississippi, Danelle watching from Oklahoma. Uh, Linda says, wow, the hat is gorgeous. So she loves that hat there. Uh, Yolanda, Thank you. So I'm getting caught up here. We we're talking about hats earlier. Yolanda says hats cost money. Uh, let's see. Uh, Arkansas, Brenna watching from Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> Jana was telling me probably not great deals on hats in Yellowstone. Yeah, I was kind of finding that out there, Jana. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Richard Pitts, uh, my mule I bought five months ago was being rode with a horse saddle and a proper. Uh, have, have bought all gear from you. Next month, think the back is healed enough to start uh, fitting saddle and gear, or is it too soon? Should I still wait a bit? How about Dave? That Dave is getting a hat. Woohoo! All right, there we go. So had this mule, rode with a horse saddle, all sore, yeah. uh, got yeah. all his stuff from you. Is it too soon to start saddling up with your stuff? Well, it's, you know, with, without me not seeing it, it's kind of hard to tell. But see, what had happened was, Dave, back in the back, right in before you, behind you sit at the kennel, that those three bones started getting pounded on by his horse saddle. And, uh, uh, or did he tell me he had a mule saddle? Anyway, anyway, it got bruised, and then it got swelled, and he had a big edema on that, on that mule. So, uh, you know, the best thing I could tell him is to go ahead and, and saddle him up and let him walk around with the pad, uh, use the come along, do some come along work with him, some groundwork and see how he reacts and then take a look at it. Watch it each time. Uh, don't where people make mistakes here. Don't push on it because it's going to be a little sore anyway. So don't do any power painting, but just kind of feel it and make sure that it's not hot and make sure that it's not swelled, but don't, don't palpate. There we go. Uh, let's see. We've got Susan saying, hello, Steve. Susan Callahan watching. We've got Amy says, made it on to listen live today. Hello, Amy. We are glad you're here. Uh, let's see. Jenny Jo Porter, my four-year-old is coming along nicely. However, he has the hardest time standing tied without pawing and pivoting around. Any ideas on how to resolve this, Steve? You bet. We can help you out with that. First, let me say to Susan Callahan, she is in the sheriff's office up uh, up in northern Arizona. Oh, yeah. And, and I just want to tell her thank you for her service. Yeah. Um, and she's, uh, I met her a few years ago at Camp Verde. And she this meal was giving her a hard time and it was a saddle problem. But I just want to tell her thank you for her service. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, the, the mule pawing is basically, and moving around, he's basically saying, I don't want to be here. And pawing is trying to get what he wants. He thinks if he paws, he'll be able to finally get away from this chain that's got him hooked up. And I would chain him because what they do is they find out they can chew it and they'll chew the rope and then they're gone. And then they got what they wanted. So what do I do? Number one, I got a hitching rail and my, my hitching rail is metal. I have chains welded to it with a snap, big bull snap. And I snap them to the center and then with about 14 inches of chain, that's all. And then I have a rubber mat laid down. And when they paw, they paw on the rubber mat. They don't paw on dirt. Now, I then take and uh, put a chain, uh, 14 inches of chain, heavy chain, like good log chain, and I put it on a strap and I put it on just above the knee on the strap. And then I take a piece of baling twine and I attach to the top length on the chain that's on the strap. And it goes across the neck down to the strap on the other side where the baling twine is. And then that baling twine keeps the, the hobble strap from the chain from falling on the ground. Here's, here's the deal. When the mule paws, the chain is going to bang him in the leg. 
and it's going to make him uncomfortable. So uh, what you want to do is be ready because as soon as that mule stops pawing, immediately pull the chains off, give him that reward. That's the reward. You don't paw, I don't put the chains on. You paw, I put the chains on. That's good. So you wouldn't you wouldn't give him a treat or anything like that, just to kind of like affirm him and, and let him know that he's doing a good job and stuff. No, I, I'm I'm not much on treats. Uh, I'm I'm okay with the pats on the neck and stuff, but this is what they want. They want to be comfortable, and you're the leader. Comfortable, uncomfortable, ask, tell, demand. So it's up to you to be close. And as soon as the mule stops pawing, the split second you can do it. Take off the hobbles and let them stand there. They go to pawing, put them back on again. So it's going to take a little work on your part, but I don't give them treats. No, -uh, I don't do that. You know, I had people tell me they give them treats because they couldn't get them to stop. And now they got them to treat. Well, what happens if they're taking off running and you're trying to give them a treat and they're scared? You've got better have a bit, you know? Yeah. Yep. Very good. Uh, next question. This one got emailed in from Rebecca says, hello, Dave and Steve. Yes, I have a question for your consideration for someone like myself who will be eventually getting my first riding mule. Where do I start when I bring him or her home? What would be the first thing you would recommend I start with to acclimate my new mule to my farm and myself? I have two geldings. Uh, horses, both 14 years old. I have front pasture and a huge back pasture. They are separated by riding ring in between. I can close off the front riding ring, close off the front riding ring and back pasture from each other. Sorry, this is such a long-winded question. Rebecca, what would you say there, Steve? Is this a welcome home, Mr. Mule? Yes, sir. Welcome home, Mr. Mule. Absolutely. Folks, the biggest problem that people have is they take them from where the mule was used to being is comfortable and relaxed, and then they take them to an uncomfortable area, and it does take them a while to acclimate. So what you need to do is put them in a, get this, a small pen, 20 by 20, no bigger, no bigger than that. You get a big pen, they don't need you. They've got everything that they need. They got their water, they got their feed, and if you get them, and, and, and if you get them to where you throw them out in a pasture, with just a bunch of other animals, you won't. You will not get their respect, and you will not get them thinking about you. Very good. Very good. Thank you. So very the much article for that, that you're going to send them, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I put that in the. Uh, I put that in the comment section. All right. Let's see here, folks. If the, you're just tuning in, if this is your first time ever watching, my name's Dave. This is Steve. We come hang out for about an hour every Wednesday, talking about mules and donkeys, answering as many questions as we can get through during the hour. Um, so if you're first time watching, please make sure you say hello in the comment section. Put your name and where you're watching from. We love knowing where uh, where everyone is coming around from. It's very cool that we can all find each other here on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, number two, go ahead. Ask your question. Whatever it is, you've got that question in your mind that you've been thinking about. Put it in the comment section. We will answer it for you or do our best to answer it for you. Number three, on Facebook, there's a share button. All we ask, uh, if you're grateful and you appreciate this broadcast, all we ask is that you click the share button and let other folks know that we're doing this here. Uh, that, that's how we keep going. Um, let's see here. We've got uh, Neil. Hi, guys. I'm looking for saddlebags for my mule. I remember hearing about not letting your bag slap against the side of your mule how is the best way to hook up your saddlebag? So we talked about that a little bit earlier, uh, but Steve, for Neil, who's just joining in, uh, what would you say about where to find them and just very quickly, best way to saddle them up? Well, basically the cannel bag, have a cannel, not the saddlebags in the back. That's the best way I know to, to get yourself in trouble. So the least we got back there in the kidney area, the better. Uh, as far as the, the saddlebags, the pummel bags go, um, I actually, uh, we, I got a company that makes them, and we've not put them on the, or have we put them on the website? Mountain Ridge Gear? Yeah. I'll put a link in the comment section so folks can get to them. Yeah. And so, anyway, he can make about whatever, and just let him know that I we sent him and go from there. But he makes a great pummel bag. He makes it where you can even put a, a firearm in it as well. He makes all kinds of ways, and very he good. makes it very good. Very good. Next question. This comes. Oh, Gary from uh, Tula Rosa says, "Gary, I'm late, but uh, Tula Rosa late, but here. Uh, let's see. Cat says, "Do you go around the country and do clinics? 
If so, are you ever coming to Missouri? Recently helping my neighbor trainer mule and I can't consume enough of your knowledge. You have helped so much. We love hearing that. Thank you, Kat. Steve. You go anywhere? Yep. You going anywhere? Yeah, I don't have any plans right now, Dave. You know, I used to. We used to travel all over. But if I get an invitation and people want to set up a clinic, you know, I'm I'm happy to, you know, to go. Uh I but I just don't travel like I used to, pulling that forty foot toy hauler and and wife and I would go border to border, coast to coast. Uh, you know, we're going to fly into a place called Australia in March and, uh, I'm going to, uh, yeah, it's going to be good. I'll be over there judging a the mule and donkey show and then seeing Dave's uh, donkeys and Dye's donkeys. Yeah. And then, um, also kind of check out their worms. Maybe we go fishing with them or something. I don't know. Don't and then I'm going to go see another buddy of mine, Ian over in uh, Queensland and he's got a small, uh, place. He says it's a small place, small station. They don't call them ranches. They call them station. And his small station is only 760 square miles. Only. Only. Yeah, only. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm, I'm kind of interested in seeing that. be pretty good. That'll be but pretty I'm, good. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to Australia. Australians, get ready. Dave, you guys need to be writing them articles and, and getting them in there. That's so right. That That's right. Coming. I'll tell you what. Folks, Steve won't say it, so I will. Uh, the, the, the best way to get the clinicians at the expos and the events is for the attendees to write in and tell the organizers who they yep. want. So you can get clinicians yep. writing in. There's, there's no shortage of people who are writing in saying, I'm a clinician, I'd love to come and present. Uh, but what really t turns the needle, what really moves the needle and gets uh, these event organizers, these expo and clinic organizers uh, to recruit in uh, clinicians is when the attendees message them. And a good yep. example of that is the Hoosier Festival out in Indiana this past year. Uh, the Hoosier Festival does not bring the same clinicians two years in a row. So Steve presented in 2018. He wasn't going to present in 2019. Well, they didn't have anyone presenting on the mules and the donkeys. And enough people wrote in, and uh, the Hoosier organizers wound yeah. up giving Steve another invite back. Did I get that correct, Steve? Yes, sir. I believe so. Yes, sir. Yeah, there we yeah, go. So that was great. You, if you want Steve to show up at an event near you, what you got to do is you got to get with your community and folks who are going to be going there to that event and let them know that you want Steve to show up. So he won't say it, but I will. If you want Steve, you got to ask for him. And that's the way these events work. That's the way these org that's what the event organizers want to hear. They want to know, hey, if we bring in this clinician, is that going to bring attendees? And so if you think uh, Steve will be a good fit, Go ahead and let those event organizers know. Uh, we got a question here from David. David's watching from Kentucky. He says, can can a mule have Milo in feed? So number one, what is Milo? And number two, can it be in the feed? Yeah, it can. It's it's a small seed, and and and, and it's a it's a it looks like corn at first, and then it ends up having a small, almost like a a piece of corn. But it's all kinds of little tiny seeds, and and uh, you know I I have never fed Milo, so I really couldn't tell you. Uh, if I was you, I'd run some testing on it and see what the carbohydrate levels are and see what the breakup is on it and see how it would affect the mule. Uh, and if you want to feed a little bit and try it, I suppose you could. Uh, but I, I've never fed any Milo, so I really I really couldn't help you out. Yep, there you go, there you go. Um, let's go to the next question. This one's from Chris. Chris emailed this one in. Hi, I bought a mammoth donkey for trail riding and I'm trying to determine his age. Your videos have been a great info to me and I dream of someday being able to come to one of your clinics. FYI, if you want Steve at one of your clinics and expos, make sure you ask the organizer. I was yeah. wondering if you think this boy might be too old to ride. He takes the saddle and the kids sit on him to lead. The former owners told me he was eight years, but his teeth are long. I was thinking 12 to 16. How old is too old for trail riding donkeys? I know lots of horses who will trail ride into their 20s. What would you say there to Chris, Steve? Oh yeah, if you know, yeah, the, the here's my favorite thing. You know, if they're if they're die on the trail, they died happy. You know, uh, but when it comes down to age, uh, there are uh, some some different things that you can look at. I I can't really tell you. See, as their mouth gets older, it starts parroting and starts growing, pushing out, and so. Uh, long in the tooth is one way to look at it. 
if you know what to look for the galvin's groove you can do that um but you know if if the donkey is is healthy and is going good saddle him up and ride him you know i my my wife's mule she, we rode her till she was 28 years old uncle bud had one that was uh, 36 years old so i think it just kind of depends on the mule you know Yep, very good. Uh, we've got Don't Sid you. over on YouTube watching us. Sid from Fancy. Uh, we're glad to have you here, Sid, uh, Sid hanging out with us. Uh, let's go back here, make sure that we've got all of our questions. Uh, Kathy from Northern Idaho is watching. Carol says, I just got a four-year-old donkey. She is very skittish and hand shy. Tough to catch. Any help is appreciated. Thanks in advance. Well, there again, it comes down to keeping them in a 20 by 20 p.m., and, uh, and then groundwork, 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 groundwork. You know, that's what's really important. Uh, too many people want to hurry up and get in a saddle, but I wouldn't do that. If I was her, I would get my ground communication kit that shows the video, uh, gives you the halter, gives you the come along rope, and then you can pretty much start doing your groundwork. Um, so we've got a video here. Uh, it's how to catch a mule on your terms. Uh, I'm going to put that in the comment section, and then I'll put a link to the uh, the foundation kit. Next question I got, this one comes from Rebecca. Rebecca says, uh, how do you stop and or slow down a bolting mule? Thanks for this opportunity to learn as much as possible about the mule and donkey. Greatly appreciate it. Okay. First thing we don't do is take on one rein, try to do a one rein stop, and go around in circles. That don't work. Try that at the Grand Canyon and then let me know how it worked for you. It's not. So what I would do is, number one, you have to think it's right brain, left brain. So we want them to stop straight. I use use right, left, right, left, right, left. But I also use my mule rider's martingale, which then sets the head. It's the proper bit uh, to, to get your, your communication done right. Um, so... Uh, and then I would practice at home. You first want to do your groundwork, having the sur single set up and having the meal going just like you see in the video. And then when the meal starts going good, then you can look at climbing on. Remember this, no bit fix the problem. No bit does. Uh, I know some people that are trying to sell bits. They call it whoa mule or something like that. And, uh, and it's not... <laughs> It's called. A, it's actually called a quick stop, but they're trying to say it's a meal bit, and it's not. So uh, you you definitely want to do do ground foundation is cheaper than going to the ER. Very good. That's right. Cheaper than going to the ER. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Linda talking about you going to uh, Australia says the Aussies are in for a treat. Yes, they are, Linda. Uh, Tracy says, can't wait to see you in Australia. Richard says, thank you so much for your information. Uh, Meredith Andrew, I have a 29-year-old mammoth. He does great, but I drive him mostly. So my question, Steve, 29, you were talking about, hey, if they die on the trail, they died happy. Is 29, yeah. is that is is that getting too old to ride? Is that getting too old to drive? Or does it just, it, it depends on the animal and you can keep keep going until the day they die? Yeah, it just kind of depends on the animal, Dave. I up at Friendly Pines Camp, we had several old mules that were in their uh, mid to late 30s, and they did just fine. They they went out on the wagons, they went uh, in saddle, and they did good. You know, um, my wife's mule, 28 years old. If she wasn't for cancer, she I'd still be riding her today. Yeah. Yeah. Very very good. Uh, let's see here. Next question. Uh, let's see, where did it go? Would the Martingale help me communicate? This one's from Donna. How does the Mule Riders Martingale work? I have a four-year-old, uh, four-year-old, 13 hand high donkey. Had her since she was six months. Have done a lot of groundwork, starting to ride. She understands voice commands if she is listening. I'm using a rubber D-ring, uh, D-ring bit. Uh, would the Martingale help me to communicate? I'm afraid she is going to figure it out. Uh, that she doesn't have to stop. P.S. I love the trail trail light saddles. So there we go. How does Good. the mule riders martingale work? Okay, basically, let's go. Number one, it's got a double twisted wire snaffle bit. That rubber bit is going to do nothing but cause you a lot of harm because the mule is not going to have respect for it. The donkey is not going to have respect for it. That rubber bit is going to do nothing but cause you problems. So 
automatically don't use that. Now, how does it work? Basically, there is your reins coming down, and then there is a, uh, a piece of a string that's a nylon string that there's a hole in the rein, and it's tied there, and then it goes down. It goes around the bit down to a strap that's adjustable and a fork like this. So the one strap comes down out of the bit to the left, one strap comes down out of the bit to the right. And, and it's forked like this. So, and then, then this string goes up around through the bit and back in the rain again. So when you pick up on the rain, you then pick up what you're using actually riding off of a string. It's similar to a uh, German martingale, but it's not as restrictive as a German martingale. So in all actuality, you're riding off a string and not off a rein. So it's way softer than a regular uh, martingale. And the thing about it is it sets the head. That's what you want. Nose on a vertical balance framed up. Very good. Uh, next question here. This one's from Sharon. It's about fat pockets. It says, I have a donkey, four years old. Just want to make sure he stays healthy and doesn't founder. Although he is uh, huge, he is not hugely fat. He has some fat pockets, I think, yeah. starting to show up on the sides of his back. He is in pasture twenty four seven. It's not overly rich and gets a cup of feed daily. Steve, what would you have to say here to Sharon? Well, you know, we've all got our fat pockets. Us guys, we know where ours are, you know, and you girls know where yours are. So we've all got the fat pockets. The problem is, is just like me. The more sugar intake I take, my fat pocket gets bigger. And it's going to be the same thing with this mule, this donkey. It does not need to be out in the pasture all the time feeding. That you're, you're, you, you're doing the mule more harm and the donkey more harm uh, by overfeeding them. It's just like you and I go into a smorgasbord. We always eat way too much. But let's go back. Uh, uh, I would definitely put a muzzle on the on the the donkey or the mule, uh, and that would help them a lot. <coughs> Pardon me to keep from overgrazing, and it's really easy to get grass founder. I mean, it's amazing how you can be going along one week and go good, and the next week, dang, here you it's there, you know. So you really have to be careful. Very good. Uh, we've got an article on grass founder and mules and donkeys. I'm going to put that in the comments section here. Uh, yep. Next question that we've got, this one is uh, this one I titled Spins and Kicks. This one's from Robin. Four-year-old mm. Molly constantly spins and kicks near mares. We have about four rides in together, but never near mares. Are there any preventative exercises I can do to prepare, prepare for when I do so? Well, it's going to take some timing on your part. But you now there again with the Mules ride, Riders Martingale, when she goes to pin her ears, you got to do it when she's thinking about it, not when it's already done. So when she goes to pin her ears, you go with your hands right, left, right, left, right, left, and really get after her and also spur. She's trying to tell these mares, I want to be the herd leader. You're not going to be the herd leader. And that's kind of what's how, why she's kicking. So it's going to take some timing on your part. It's, it's natural for her to think she's a leader. There you go. So, Steve, uh, Yolanda says, uh, thanks, Steve. My pat fat pockets are just fine. <laughs> I'm not touching that one. <laughs> not with a 10-foot pole, Yolanda. No. We love you. We appreciate you here. Uh, let's see. This question, this one's from Nat. Nat has the question, I want to start training one of my mules to pack. Where do I start? Well, you start by just uh, taking your saddle and um, and you can actually use it uh, for, for packing and uh, and put different hitches on it and this sort of thing. Nat, you have my videos on packing and uh, and you can learn how to you can take the saddle that you have there and you can actually put some bags on it and and start tying your hitches. Very good. All right, let's look here. Let's see what other questions we've got. Richard over on YouTube says, thanks so much for your information, Richard. We're absolutely thrilled to be here every week. Yolanda says, only shanks work on mules. So what are shanks, and is that the only thing that works on mules? I know she's 
Y- Yolanda's a, a, a pistol, and so I know she's probably yeah. tongue-in-cheek here, but I'm reading it, and I don't know what shanks are, and I don't know if that's the truth. Well, I mean, you know, we can look at shank. If we're, if we're in prison, it's actually a handmade knife. Uh, oh. But <laughs> oh, she's I making think- a joke. <laughs> oh, she's making a joke? Oh, Yolanda. <laughs> uh, she goes, gotcha. My goodness. She did get me. She yeah. got me good. All right. Let's see. Okay. This question here, this one's from Connie. Connie put this over on YouTube. I rescued a young castrated Jack donkey about six months ago. He is a year and a half old. Just recently introduced him to a 12-year-old Jenny, Jenny I just adopted. He is all over her uh, to yeah. where he has rubbed the fur off her shoulders and won't let my three-year-old curious gelding anywhere near her. Is this typical behavior for a young Jack? Should I separate my Jack from the Jenny? Jenny, uh, does the newness wear off from my Jack? The newness will wear off, and yes, I would separate him. Uh, evidently, he's still got some testosterone running there, which happens sometimes and, and sometimes not. But uh, I, would, I, I like to keep all my animals separate anyway to keep from hurting them. And a young jack likes to play. So, you know, they'll be, they'll be playing for quite a while sometimes, it's just playful and it's not so bad. But if they are playing and they bite each other and they bite a tendon, then you've got crippled animals. So uh, I personally keep them separated all the time. Very good. Uh, next question here. This is about the Sir single. Uh, it's from Andrea. I want to buy the Martingale package uh, and the Sir single. My donkey is just under 14 hands. Will the Sir single fit? Do I need a girth or does the Sir single go all the way around? Hard to tell from the picture. Love your videos. Did not have a problem picking up the hind feet until after the farrier came. Glad to see a video on how to handle this new issue. So the Sir Single, Steve, what would you say? Well, the Sir Single has two nylon latigo straps. And then you put a cinch in, in the middle. So you can conceivably buy a 24-inch cinch. And it, and the Sir Single comes with the latigos. And you can cinch it right up like you do a saddle. All right. Steve, that is all the questions that we have for today. Damn. And we have three minutes left. So if anybody has any final questions, please do feel free to put them in there. We've got probably about 40 or 50 people watching and hanging out. Um, let's see, hanging out with us today. So uh, if any of y'all have any final questions, Steve, do you have anything coming up here in the next uh, next couple of weeks that you're excited about? Well, not, you know, not right off of that next couple of weeks. Um uh, I've got uh, been doing quite a bit of things at the fire department. We were just uh, testing hoses last night, and we did the testing of, uh, of the driving the fire engine and the other trucks, and I passed that. And so I've been doing that. But we're going to be going down to the Andrada Ranch uh, on the 19th and 20th, and uh, we're going to be taking the boys, and we're going to be doing some, uh, some videoing down there and, yeah. and let them do some writing and do some cowboy stuff there. But this winter, we're going to be doing quite a bit down to Andrada. And then, of course, so we got the up and coming with Dave and, and Di and Ian uh, and this sort of thing in Australia. So that's kind of up and coming. But, you know, I'm always looking for an expo or somebody wants to do a, a clinic someplace. Be happy to do it. But we're, uh, we've are got plenty to do around this ranch. Man, especially plenty, to, my- plenty to do around the ranch. We've been finding a lot more... Uh, we've been meeting a lot of new people, a lot of new yeah. folks on Facebook who are finding yeah. us, a lot of new folks on YouTube. And golly, I'll tell you what, the, the number of emails that are coming through, folks just wanting to find the right product or wanting to get to the right video, uh, that just keeps growing. And then uh, folks yeah. who are looking to get saddles, we've been selling saddles like crazy. Yep. Um, and, uh, and I know that folks are really happy once they get them, once they come in the mail there. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I don't yeah, think. Th- yeah, Dale, uh, and uh, I'll I tell you a little story. Dale yeah. in, uh, in uh, Arlington, Texas, he's a pilot, and he's also a helicopter pilot, and, he's, and, he, and he was uh, a commercial airline pilot as well, jets. He decided to get into mules. Well, he's had some frustrated times. He got bucked off, and so that, that kind of hurt him a little bit, but he's back in good shape again. But uh, anyway, he called me yesterday all frustrated that he couldn't climb on the mule and he's having some problems. And I told him, all right, do this and this and this. And he did it today. He called me back and said, man, Steve, I'm, I'm, everything's going good again. You know, so 
uh, folks, I, I will call you. I will help you. Yeah. That's that's what I'm here for. You know, I I really do want to help. I've had as many as 124 phone calls in one day that had been different phone calls, all just a few minutes, few seconds, even. You know, but uh, I'll, I'll do whatever I got to do to help you ride ride through. Yeah. All right. We got two final questions, and then we'll call uh, call this show a wrap. This one's from right. Kat, who's just been fantastic in the broadcast today. Thank you so much, Kat. Love your <laughs> questions. Love being able to help you. Love getting to know you a little bit more. Kat says, going back to teaching the mule to uh, go from pulling under saddle, picking up on the rein, uh, on the left, do I allow bump on the left or on the right? Well, what you're going to do is it's going to be more direct. So your hands are going to be here. It's not really a bump. You just give, you're going to go to the left. So you're going to, to take your hands and just turn your wrist, and then this is direction, and this is impulsion. Do not use your legs. Want them to listen to a neck rein first. So direction, impulsion, that's the way you're gonna go. But don't pull. Your hands are roughly gonna be about 12 to 13 inches apart. There we go, very good. Final question. Last question, this one's from Kate. Kate says, how do I get a donkey on a float? He used to go on and off, go on and off a stationary float, uh, but not happy after he went on a trip. Steve, what would you say? On a float, they're taking him on a boat across. That's what I was guessing. I figured it what wasn't it getting like. them up on a parade float. I think it was more going back and forth, maybe on a river. Cat or Kate, do you want to give us a little bit more context? Let's say that it is getting yeah. on a float to go across a river. Go ahead and answer that, Stephen. We'll see if Kate gives us a little bit more context. Yeah, I actually did that uh, last year over in uh, in Alaska. That was Alaska, in, yeah. In Kodiak. But we used the come-along hitch, and and, and we, we did really good with it. So uh, it is a little scary for them. Uh, they can't see the depth perception-wise and this sort of thing. So just put the come-along hitch on there and rock and roll. Yeah, it I, does it does it kind of go back to the whole idea of desensitization and you know the the idea of hey you don't want to work on desensitizing because you can't train on how to go across a river if you don't have a river in your backyard you can't train how to communicate when a bear comes up on you if you don't have a bear you can't train to go through a you know a little bit of a canyon or 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 turn around. In a, in, a, in a small diameter circle if you don't if, if you're not there on the edge of a cliff um, does it kind of go back to that a little bit Steve there's always that that time where they won't cross a river or something like that but you know having the right tools and a little knowledge use that come along hitch you'll get the job done there we go. Well, Steve, that's everything for this week. Thank you so much for hanging out with us uh, right here at the tail end. I've got a couple technical difficulties. It's showing two of my faces and none of yours, and I have no idea what happened here. Uh, let's see. Nice. There it goes. I don't know what's going on, but it, it that's the sign right there. That's a, Hey, Technology. we've answered oh. all the questions. Technology is getting the better of me at the very end. Thanks you so much, everyone, right. for hanging out spending a little bit of time with us. We are very grateful that you make this show possible every single week. Steve, thanks for taking some of your time answering all these questions. And folks, if you need to get a hold of him, just give him a call, 602-999-6853. You can find his phone number on the website, muleranch.com. If he doesn't answer, Steve, just leave a voicemail, right? And you'll get back yep. with him. Yep, you bet. And hey, we got some really exciting things coming up. Uh, I've got I've got one of our clients who's got a mule with a really bad contracted heels. And so we got a farrier that's doing a good job of lining things out. So you all are going to start seeing on YouTube this farrier actually doing the work to to get the heel to be wider. You've seen the videos there, huh, Dave? Yeah. Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be yeah. fantastic. Well, folks. Stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. Keep hanging yep. out with us on uh, on Facebook and YouTube here, and uh, you'll be the first ones to know about everything we're coming out. Thank you so much. God bless. Yeah. Have a yeah. great rest of your day, folks. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye now. And remember our first responders. That's right. Absolutely. Take care.